today's <laughs> today's topic and session. Um, I'm going to share um, the presentation link with you. There are links on the presentation slides that you can probably access um, easily. So let me just drop the presentation link in in chat, and you should be able to just click on the link and um, and follow it on your screen if you if you want to. So once again, welcome everyone. My name is Christina Damian, and um, I am a term faculty in um, the OGIS department, and I teach um, at the English Language Training Academy. And together with my colleagues, Susan and Max, today we are going to talk about um, AI and leveraging the power of generative and assistive AI tools in higher education, strategies for management, utilization, and awareness. This is a workshop, so we really uh, encourage you to join us and just follow what we do. Um, if you have, um, and if you can multitask fairly easily, we welcome you to, to go to these websites that we share with you. If you are a ChatGPT user or a Google Bard user already, just open those in, um, in different tabs. And once again, just you know, follow our lead, experiment with us. So, um, you know, let's use this session as an informative, you know, working session at the same time. Um, and so, as you can see, today's session, we would like you to gain a deeper understanding of the capabilities, the benefits, and the limitations of these tools. How can they be used in the classroom? Um, identify some practical strategies for integrating generative and assistive AI tools into curriculum and instruction, prevent some bad practices before they fossilize and start on some good ones, um, and effectively manage student access and use of AI tools. And hopefully, together with you, we can co-create a toolbox of strategies by identifying how to support these tools in our classrooms and how to view them as pedagogical interventions. We'll have a Q&A at the end of the session as well. But feel free to ask so you know you don't have to wait until let's say you know 12 o'clock or 12. So just whenever you have a question, just please you know unmute yourself and let us know what the concerns are or what the questions are. And so first we're going to provide you with a quick uh, overview of the capabilities of generative AI tools, and especially focusing on uh, what research um, says about these tools. And so I'm going to hand it over to Max. Thank you, Christina. I think you can see my screen now. That's what I intend, at least. I am uh, Max Reinhardt. I work with Christina uh, and with Susan, uh, my co-presenters at uh, ELTA uh, down in the Spring Valley building. We teach international students uh, in the intensive English program. Uh, so a question to start it all out. Um, Think about some of uh, the students' work that you have seen this semester, last semester, recent past, and think about the kind of feedback that you've provided. Uh, does there seem to be any one kind of feedback that you provide most frequently or very frequently? You can share uh, out loud or enter it in the chat. I'll give you a second to think about it. Mm, not following instructions, yes. Organization, all right. That's 
always a challenge for our students, always a challenge for some of our students at least. I teach a graduate practicum and I provide a lot of feedback both on oral presentations and their written work and trying to help them understand how to translate their communication skills from academia to the professional world. And I do a lot of um, feedback to the teams. Um, and also we work on listening as well. Um, and it's a lot of oral feedback in my case, as well as offering suggested edits, but I go over those edits with them so that they can push back and say, no, we did this report this way for these reasons. Thank you. Okay, thank you for sharing. All right. Yeah, including your own take rather than just restating what you've read in the sources. I, I tell my students to do that all the time. Um, all right, a lot of great suggestions in here. A lot of the kinds of feedback that I am certainly familiar with having to give my students, some of which is uh, maybe uh, a little bit more specific to classes more advanced than the ones that I teach. Um, so let me ask a second question. When you provide feedback on sort of small picture things, uh, details like sentence clarity, um, misuse of vocabulary, careless errors, uh, do you ever think that you would rather be spending your time providing suggestions uh, about ideas and logic and content and following instructions for the assignment and providing your own take rather than just restating ideas from the the readings. I assume careless, I mean, carless spelling is to make us awake and smile. <laughs> Eagle eyed viewers, uh, participants <laughs> may pick that one up. Yes. So, absolutely. Yes. Short answer. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh, pardon me. I was certainly uh, leading you all to uh, what I thought was the obvious answer, which is yes. Well, um, of the types of feedback that you have said you uh, provide quite frequently, and that leading question that I asked you about, would you rather focus on big picture stuff? Uh, those lead us to uh, the idea of generative AI and how we can use it uh, for students as a learning tool rather than um, something that might undercut their learning. Um, because those kinds of feedback, many of the kinds of feedback uh, that you all mentioned, you tend to provide. And um, also um, the kind of small detail level, sentence level clarity, word choice, grammar, those carless errors, careless errors, uh, both of these kinds of feedback uh, can be provided to some extent or to a great extent by various uh, automatic written corrective feedback AWCF programs. But it is natural. I certainly had this reaction um, to think that uh, error correction of automated origin, that is from Grammarly, from WordTune, even from my, uh, like Microsoft Office spell checker, um, that kind of error correction from uh, computers might prevent the development of writing skills, right? We think, oh, if we just, if some computer is just telling our students what to change, they're not really learning anything, right? Um, it's a natural concern, it's a logical concern. And that certainly can happen some of the time. But the research suggests that the answer is not necessarily. This does not have to be a shortcut that undercuts the learning process. Uh, the metalinguistic explanation, more on that in just a moment, and direct error correction of automated origin can be generally or is uh, generally effective in addressing errors of various types. And by addressing errors of various types, that means short-term uh, producing 
a correct or better form and also long-term contributing to the learning process. Um, if you don't know what metalinguistic commentary is, there's an example up on the top. That is when one takes the time to explain the rationale behind why this is an error or why this requires improvement, whereas uh, the example below shows direct correction, where you just say, instead of this, say this, change this grammar, change this word, um, change this citation. And uh, you're going to hear a lot today about Quillbot and WordTune. Uh, these are websites, software, apps that can provide uh, the kind of um, grammar and uh, revision feedback uh, similar to Grammarly, which is the one that everyone is familiar with and which you may have seen starting to advertise quite a bit recently. Um, which has been around longer, but we find Quillbot and WordTune to be a little bit more robust, a little bit more helpful. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. But if you're familiar with Grammarly, this is certainly in the same ballpark. Uh, those apps, those softwares, uh, Quillbot and WordTune can provide direct correction in the form of a list of options for improvement. We'll try it out. We will see some examples later. Um, and ChatGPT can provide detailed explanation of why grammar, of why it made a certain uh, suggestion for grammar change uh, if you ask it to explain its reasoning. Um, so from both of these, we can get uh, the um, direct correction and the metalinguistic commentary for uh, improving something uh, that a student has written. And both of these can be helpful. Both of these can be a step in the learning process if uh, the student is engaged in the process. If the student uh, takes the time to try to learn from these suggestions uh, rather than just accepting without thinking about it, uh, this can be um, this can be a contribution to the development of their writing skills. Um, a question about whether Quillbot or WordTune integrate with Canvas. Um, not that I am aware of. Um, perhaps Christina or Susan can correct me, but um, I uh, don't know that I, I don't know of that function. Um, maybe we'll see it. Uh, Canvas is always adding features, so that might be helpful. Um, I'm sorry, I may have uh, gone too far ahead. Okay, yes. Um, so the feedback provided by these apps is not necessarily a detriment to our student learning. It can be beneficial. Furthermore, teachers and students like the idea. Um, teachers have positive perceptions towards the use of instructional technology, um, aside from you know, fears, which we also very frequently have. Uh, it's appealing, isn't it? We we want the you know any help that we can get as long as it benefits our students in addition to saving us some time. Uh, and students like automated feedback. Um, I'm not sure why, uh, but uh, perhaps the ease of access. But something contributes to their satisfaction with these results. Uh, according to this one study, students were more satisfied with the feedback that they got from Grammarly than the feedback that they got from a person who they met with to discuss revisions to uh, their writing. So teachers like the idea, um, students like the idea. So I think it behooves us to try to make it work rather than to fear it and avoid it. Um, though there is a whole spectrum of reactions, particularly to ChatGPT, which hit the news and caused quite a stir. I'm sure you all remember. It's still happening now. Uh, but if you were to look around, um, not at research, it's a little bit early for a lot of that to have come out, but just uh, you know, the uh, um, educational blog community, uh, there are all kinds of responses to this. Um, some teachers doing what we might um, 
characterize as capitulating, just saying, oh, this is this is what's happening now, and just students are going to use it, so we'll just let them use it. Um, others being a little bit more uh, proactive and trying to figure out strategies to set boundaries and decide exactly how it will be permitted and how we can uh, mitigate abuse. Some of it are looking at it as uh, really a positive thing that uh, leads to more inclusivity in the classroom, particularly for our international students or um, for students who struggle to use what we have, some might say, arbitrarily defined as standard English. Uh, it can really help students to um, produce that kind of writing if it doesn't come to them uh, naturally or, or from uh, their training so far. And we, and when I say we, I mean Christina, Susan, and I agree that it is an inevitable and it is potentially beneficial. That is, of course, contingent upon the teacher's proper implementation and understanding of how it can be used. Um, and I believe I am handing it off to Christina now. Or perhaps to Susan. No, to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. All right, and at this point, I would like, Lindsay, if you could please launch this poll. It has two questions. And one of the questions is, which tools are you familiar with or use on a regular basis? And the second question will be about your students, basically the same. Do you know if they're using any of these tools? So please go ahead and respond to the poll. And just to give you a quick um, preview of what's going to happen in, um, in the next you know, few days, probably to your computer, because we're talking about all these tools. Let's say if you are a Grammarly user, you're probably going to start receiving all kinds of ads from WordTune and Quillbot, <laughs> uh, especially if you watch YouTube or you know, just open up an article and those will pop up. Or if you decide to switch over to WordTune, then it's going to be Grammarly just <laughs> trying to lure you back to their platform. So there is a fierce competition between these platforms for sure. All right, so maybe we should give it another couple of seconds and then we can see the result of the polls. Um, Lindsay, at this point, can we see the results? It says that I'm sharing it right now. Um, maybe if if you're in your Zoom toolbar, if you click on polls, you might it might come we up. We can see it. We can okay. see it. Yeah. It's okay. Not... Thank you. Okay. I wasn't sure. Right. So we can see that you know Grammarly is the lead platform or the lead tool, and um, ChatGPT is basically right up in there. <laughs> And then now the Google Bard has invited probably quite a few people to experiment with it. We can see that and a little bit of WordTune. And when it comes to the students, so we have Grammarly, ChatGPT, and Google Bard as well. All right, well, thank you for responding. And the reason why I'm asking these questions, because of course, once we start talking about Quillbot and WordTune, I just wanna make sure that I'm not preaching to the choir, but. <laughs> These are tools that you might not be familiar with or know what they can be used for. And just thinking about what Max um, has asked you earlier 
about, uh, you know, would you like to save some time or, you know, how would you sort of reorganize the feedback that you, you give to the students? So they're all kind of related. Um, so let me just move on to the next uh, slide right here. So in our ELTA program, the English Language Training Academy at OGIS, um, we noticed that students um, started using some of these tools, not just Grammarly. I've seen a lot of WordTune and Quillbot in use as well. Um, however, their attempts weren't always that successful. Um, sometimes these tools and well, these tools had been designed uh, with good intentions, but sometimes the students just don't take the time to study the tools and they end up causing more problems for themselves and of course, uh, more work for me. Um, and my biggest fear is that we just end up with the same failure as um, uh, with social media, it was launched without no rules and regulations really, and then um, people went rogue. <laughs> and so now it's kind of out of control. Um, so my argument is that we should establish basic rules for these AI tools in the classrooms before those bad practices fossilize. And these tools keep evolving and the creators do have students in mind. So they start adding more educational uh, pages to these platforms. Um, and so that is that is what's happening. Um, now, um, asking students to submit, you know, to type up and submit their work on Canvas is simply digitizing the process, the analog process itself. Um, it doesn't necessarily improve learning. Perhaps one's keyboard skills, keyboarding skills are, are getting better. Or, you know, there's a little bit of more learning about digital literacy, how you can navigate a learning management system. But how can we just avoid simply digitizing the learning process and move beyond that? Um, when we look at our students today, our students are predominantly Gen Z, Generation Z, or the internet generation. Um, this is how they think. I have a problem, I need a solution, and I'm pretty sure there's an app for it. There's an app for everything. So I'm gonna go ahead and look for one, right? Um, for example, you know, I always ask people this question, do you know how to split a check when you share a lift? Have you ever tried that? If you don't know how to split a check, I, I don't know either, but my son does, you know, oh, I went with the friends, we split in three. I'm like, how do you do that? What, what do you do in the thing that they know? Like they, they can figure it out. <laughs> um, and so it's true, not only for the domestic students, but the international students as well. So they are, um, you know, they are definitely digital natives and they, they use tools, but the question is, you know, do they always know um, how to solve their problems or, you know, to what extent? And so that's why we're here to, um, to figure that out. Um, I'm a member of the ISTE organization and this organization in the International Society for Technology and Education. Um, really embraces technology in teaching practices. And uh, my, my goal personally is to leverage technology and my students' digital competence so that they can emerge as empowered learners with good digital literacy skills and now AI literacy skills as well. Um, and the ISTE organization has been addressing um, AI in education for years now. So of course, when, you know, as soon as ChatGPT you know, broke the internet, <laughs> um, they applauded the large language model becoming so popular because then they understood that, okay, we can now start talking about it and see what, um, what the students can do. Um, and I also would like to emphasize the fact that to me, the most appealing um, aspect of these tools, not just ChatGPT or uh, Google Bard, but also Grammarly, you know, WordTune and Quillbot, that the, they are actually, if you think about it, they are um, inclusive pedagogical interventions. If you have English language learners in your courses, you have first generation college students, you know, how do I create an outline? What is a memo? What does a lab report look like? Um, students with learning disabilities, anxiety, these tools can actually help them um, with the tasks. 
So the question is, what can we do and how can, you know, where do we even start? How can faculty um, within their discipline guide students and prevent the misuse of these well-intended programs? And I guess I wouldn't even use the word misuse. I would say, you know, underutilized tools. Sometimes students think that, uh, let's say, word to include and grammarly, they are a quick fix for, um, you know, grammar, punctuation, you know, just basic mechanics. And they don't understand that these tools can offer so much more than that. Now, we're not alone at American University <laughs> or in the United States. These tools are incredibly powerful and, uh, and really helpful. And around the world, people are trying to figure out what to do with these AI chatbots in education. So if you look at this slide right here, you can see that, um, yeah, so a lot of countries are thinking, okay, what do we do now? And um, if you compare these articles, um, they are actually fully available on this site called Pedagogy Cloud. Um, I took these snippets from Instagram, but they have a website and they are also available on Facebook as well. And I'm sure that soon they are going to appear on LinkedIn. Um, and they focus on using AI and implementing AI tools in, in education. They have really, really good tips. Um, but so, you know, as you look at the, the articles or, you know, some of the headlines from these articles, um, basically the vote says that higher education and, and teachers are embracing AI, AI because they understand that it's out there. So we can't just ignore it. We just need to start thinking about, okay, wh where do we go from here? You know, what do we do? Um, and so I argue for teacher-led strategic use, telling students exactly what to do, how to do it, so then they can, um, they can manage uh, these tools and they don't um, overuse it or underuse it. And I feel that the total ban saying you're not allowed to blah, 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 never in my course might be just misguided vigilance. And so, you know, let's let's just think about, you know, when not to use because it's OK to um, to limit its use. But, you know, when and how. So those questions um, should take place. And of course, disciplines are so different. Um, teaching units are so very different. I highly recommend that you form. Uh, these communities of practice and just sit down with other educators and have that conversation. Um, before you recommend any of these tools to your students or start using uh, um, them yourself, I, I recommend that you try them out. And um, please, please go over to the frequently asked questions bit on WordTune, on Quillbot, on ChatGPT, on BARD, because you have very specific, I mean, um, the creators know that we have all these questions <laughs> and we're asking these questions and we're worried about certain things. We are concerned about plagiarism. We're concerned about just, you know, students having, you know, making these tools do the work for them completely so they know. And so if you go to these websites, they will give you um, very specific ideas about, you know, how to look for clues and, um, and what they consider as, as plagiarism. So that's that's something to do. Um, reading these FAQs together with your students would be a very, very good first step. And, and just telling the students that, you know, if you're using these tools, you're the driver, just like driving a car. If you're going too fast, you're gonna wreck it. And so, um, it's it's just giving them the idea that you know they are in charge, and and they need to um, see how how they can use it use them well. Also, when it comes to terms of use, this time I know that we just normally you know well I I don't want to say we <laughs> I don't just click accept because you know who has time to read all the pages. Um, I can promise you that the terms of use on these pages are fairly short. So it's fairly short for ChatGPT. It's fairly short for Google Bard, WordToon, Quillbot. But it's good to read them because, um, for instance, if you teach freshmen, some of them are not 18. And, um, and to be honest, some of these tools are not designed for anyone under the age of 18. Or you actually need a letter from uh, their guardian or parents. So it's, you know, it's, it's good to know what's, um, 
what the recommendations are. Uh, now, ChatGPT has been lowered from 18 to 13. Google Bard says no, it's it's you has you have to be 18. Wordtune says if you have an educator helping you, then you're good. And that's the same with Pullabot. Like if there's an educator helping you navigate everything, then you know over 13 is um, is the limit. But it's you know it's good to go over what's in the terms of per, uh, service and things that students can copy and, uh, you know, uh, privacy, again, information they share, there has to be that discussion. Um, and as I said it before, the companies are aware of their competitors and, um, and of course they want to make themselves look the best. For instance, here, Coolbot um, is considering its platform to AI writing saying that, oh, we're so much nicer than ChatGPT. That thing is out of control. We are, you know, trust us. But if you really start discovering the details, you realize that it's very close to what ChatGPT can do. So uh, maybe a little bit more controlled, but very, very close. And of course, if you just think about the name Quillbot, I mean, it's, you know, the name itself is, is already telling. Um, Wartoon created a whole page in it in which it compares uh, Wordtune to ChatGPT. And of course, if you just take a look at the table, you can see all the check marks with Wordtune. Like, see, again, we are so much more and so much better than ChatGPT. So yes, the competition is there and it's, um, it's fierce. But also, if you look at these pages, it's reassuring because you think, okay, so they are thinking about students and they are thinking about teacher, teachers and their concerns, and they are addressing those concerns. Um, Quillbot has a whole page about um, teaching paraphrasing to students. So they, they are thinking about us for sure. But just going back to you know, the premise here, and on, in any given semester, um, I have learners with diverse academic skills. And you know, I ask myself the question, how can I create an inclusive and equitable learning experience for them? Um, make sure that they actually retain learner autonomy at the same time, so I'm not helping them too much. And my ultimate goal is for them to complete the tasks that I assign. Everybody gets the same task. They get the same grading rubric. Now, how they get there, of course, you know, it's it's up to them. But I believe that these tools can probably um, help make those um, assignments and the learning objectives more attainable. Okay, so one thing about Quillbot here. Um, Quillbot can help with, and just look at this. So going back to Max's question to you a little bit ago, when, when he says, what kind of you know, feedback do you provide? You know, if you ever said, well, you need to do more proofreading, you need to expand your vocabulary, use better synonyms, you know, check your word count, um, check the citation, you know, you didn't use APA or MLA, or um, you need to paraphrase this part in your essay or in your paragraph a little bit more, improve your style. So Quillbot can provide that feedback with suggestions to, to the students. So it is, um, it is helpful. And if you go to this page um, on Quillbot, so quillbot.com student resources, that's where it will have a lot of information from, from the students. Now, um, let me give you a link to Jamboard. And what I would like you to do in the next five minutes, if you could please copy um, this text, but here, let me just. Make it easier. So um, in the chat box, now you can see a link to Jamboard. And so on Jamboard, you can see the paragraph from my slide. So if you could please copy the paragraph, this is something that I share with my students. I wrote this paragraph and I say, okay, let's see how we can tweak it, how we can make it better. And so I asked my students, copy the paragraph and go to Quillbot. So copy the paragraph and go to Quillbot. Um, and once you are on Quillbot, we can 
we can do very simply just uh, the regular interface of Quillbot, which looks like this. So if you just type in quillbot.com, Because there is a word limit for the free version, you might not be able to copy the entire, I mean, you will be able to copy the entire paragraph over, but it might just give you suggestion up to, I think, 125 words. And so I tell students, I tell them, don't pay for the premium because, you know, you're a student, you don't have the money. But, you know, this is where you can split those paragraphs um, into two and then do it bit by bit. Um, and so what you can do is you can copy and paste the text here and see what kind of um, suggestions Quillbot can do. Oh. So we're, we're looking at this text right here. And what I would like you to do, so again, spend a few minutes on tweaking uh, this paragraph right here. And once you have um, a much better version, something that you're like, well, oh, yeah, I, I like this one. This one looks, you know, this one looks much better. Go to the next pages. There's page three, four, and five. And you can just um, copy paste your sort of final version of that paragraph. And if you have any questions in the meantime, please let us know. But this is what it looks like once you copy it over. And then you can just click on paraphrase. You can change between these different modes, fluency and standard. You can also um, change where this bar is set to. Do you want fewer changes to be made or more changes to be made? You can also go over to the grammar checker. And then copy paste the paragraph. And you can just um, instruct Quillbot to fix the errors. And um, so there was a question earlier about, is it part of Canvas or can it be integrated to Canvas? So I don't know if it's worth adding that to Canvas. What I would recommend is um, adding Quillbot and WordTune to Google Chrome, because then even if you're just writing an email using um, our Outlook, it can help you paraphrase your sentences. So if you're writing a letter to an email to your dean asking for more money spent on professional development, you can just highlight those sentences and click on paraphrase and, you know, maybe you'll have a much nicer email sent to, to the dean. So it's, there are a lot of things that you can do with it. Um, but like I said, you know, you can edit to Chrome, you can, and once you edit to Chrome, so use it as an extension, you can, you can look at sentences like this and see WordTune is built in. So now it can give me ideas on how to rewrite um, a phrase, or I can add, I can add the entire paragraph. And, um, and if I want to change a few sentences, I can just go sentence by sentence and see what WordTune can recommend. So 
Again, I don't know how it would work with Canvas, but it works perfectly well with Google Docs. I use Google Docs with my students. So that's something um, you can do. Um, there is another option in Quillbot. It's called CoWriter. And uh, it's almost a little bit like using ChatGPT that it will give you ideas. So if, um, if you put a paragraph in there or a few sentences, well, for some reason, it's having difficulty loading now. Um, but you, and here, let me show you what it can do. So for example, if you ask um, Quillbot to give you, to help you with an outline for an essay, and um, what it does is you can just click on next to the, um, let's say this phrase right here, definition of AI. And if you go there, um, it says suggest text, then it's going to suggest a definition or maybe three different definitions that students can choose from, right? So it does have that, language model built in the generative part of you know of ai um all right let's see if does anyone have any it looks very blank here. <laughs> any um success revising this paragraph I had a difficult time copying and pasting it into the app. And so I just gave up. I found it very useful when you showed the definition to us and I could follow along with um, what you were doing and found that very helpful. Um, but yeah, I, we used to be able uh, to just drop the information in the chat box on Zoom, but that um, that uh, option has been disabled by Zoom, so we, we can no longer do that. But following you was good. I just have to admit that I failed my assignment, but I am happy to learn from you in another way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another option that you might find helpful, you know, if, if you ask students to, let's say, you know, write a research paper, uh, it's not going to write a paper for them but um, it's going to help them just create that outline. Let's say if you're asking them to use APA, then it's going to be like this. So, you know, they, they have to add the information themselves, but at least, you know, you don't have to say things like, well, you should have used whatever font and whatever number and, you know, where's your abstract or what happened to the, it's there. So the students can, and again, um, international students who might not be familiar with the, you know, the formulaic nature of writing in, um, in English, um, or, you know, students uh, who are first generation uh, students, so they can't ask parents like, oh, you know, do you remember how you did that? So no, well, here's, you know, here, here's a very useful tool for that, um, for that purpose. Um, and either way, if you ask students to experiment with these tools, at least for the first two times, just ask them, okay, so you use the tool, what editing feedback did you receive? Was it helpful? What was your thought process as you were looking at? So if you ask them a couple of times, um, fingers crossed that maybe after that, it's going to be sort of this built-in metacognition in the process so that they actually realize, oh, I should be asking these questions. <laughs> And so it's, you know, it's good to have that initial conversation with the students. Um, here's another thing, and, you know, this time about Wordtune. Um, there's a paragraph, and, um, and if you have access to Jamboard, I added the, um, oh, we can actually see one right here. So I assume that whoever posted it, you used the, uh, the summary or the shorten option. Um, so now if you if you look at this section right here, so there's a paragraph and let me just show you, oops. 
Let me just show you what um, Wordtune can do. So you can go to the website called Wordtune. Um, Wordtune, once it's added to Google Chrome, it's going to look like this. And you know the students, once again, can go sentence by sentence, or they can just go to the website itself. And this is the website. And once you add the paragraph in there, we have the, the editor's notes on the side. So just like with Grammarly, you know, the students got to see the feedback from Grammarly. Same with Wordtune. And they can ignore those suggestions or accept them depending on, you know, what they want. Um, they can go sentence by sentence to, you know, to rewrite the paragraph. They can go between casual and formal. If the goal is to make the paragraph sh or the sentences shorter, sometimes we have um, we have students who write incredibly long sentences. It's like where does it <laughs> is going to end anytime soon? It's you know line five now, and it's the same uh, same sentence. So if you have students like that, you know just use this. Make sure that you shorten some of your sentences. Or if you have students who write very brief sentences, well, do the opposite. Um, and also, if you have students, if you find yourself uh, giving the feedback, explain yourself or finish your thought. What do you mean? Explain, uh, give an example. Then um, the spices using this option is, is really, really wonderful. Um, here, the student can just click on explain. And so they can see what it means to explain a thought. So they can just click on that and they will get that um, example. And they don't have to accept it, but especially if they just practice the idea, it's good. Um, you know, another suggestion. So it wasn't good enough. You know, no, 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 I, I didn't want to explain it this way. I want to, <laughs> okay, another, you know. Again, practicing that skill um, or, you know, emphasize, there's that. So there's explain, there's emphasize, there's give an example. There's even a, an option within Spices that says, um, make a joke. <laughs> so if you teach creative writing, maybe that's one way to, you know, um, to enlighten. Uh, the mood or, you know, statistical fact, what it means, give an analogy. Sometimes it's hard for students because, you know, grasping analogies can be, you know, um, a high level um, skill. So then, you know, just just practicing all those skills, adding an inspirational quote in there. So, um, again, I think that this is super useful for the students. And, you know, you have access to to this paragraph on, on Jamboard. So feel free to, you know, tweak it and then just play with um, all these options provided by Wordtune. Uh, quick caveat though, Wordtune, I think you run out of maybe nine, 10 sentences per day for free. Um, in that case, tell the students, use it on topic sentences, thesis statements, the important parts of, uh, you know, of the paper or just, don't do it last minute. And then if you have three days to revise your work, then that's 30 sentences. So it's just, you know, do the math um, that way. But once again, it's very important to emphasize the, uh, the, metacognition, uh, the metacognition in the process and just think about, okay, what did you do? Um, and here's the thing about the paragraph. So I gave it to Chad GPT and I said, okay, help me provide feedback to the student on the paragraph. And, and this is what Chad GPT did. Um, and so again, you know, reducing your workload as, as the teacher. And you don't have to agree with everything that Chad GPT says. You don't have, you know, you don't have to agree with everything. But you know, it gives you a nice idea of what you can uh, what you can say, and and if you happen to agree, like oh yeah, there was vague language and true, you know, citation was done inadequately. So then then you can go ahead and give it to the students, uh, or to the student. And I asked Google Bard as well. Now with Google Bard though, um, 
this is what I said, provide feedback like a teacher to the student who wrote this paragraph with regard to how well the student integrated sources. So I really wanted to emphasize source integration because this is what I was practicing with my students. And so there you go, Google Bard was very nice. Dear student, I read your paragraph and this is what I think. I also tell students to do the same thing. If they write something in class and they were not allowed to use um, tools initially, then I say, okay, for revision, put it through the process and see what it says. And so we're also learning how to prompt these tools at the same time. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Susan about the limitations of generative AI tools. Thank you, Christina. Um, let me share my screen. Yes. Okay. All right. Because we've been hearing so much about the positives of um, Chat, uh, Chat GPT and all the tech tools, I was wondering if any of you have anything other than positives to say about the tech tools. So I'm going to open a Jamboard. This is a much simpler Jamboard. If you could click on just the, um, the stickies and just use the stickies to um, drop comments on either side. Uh, on either side, the I'm sorry, is that Christina's? Uh, is everybody able to open the Jamboard? Okay. It I think so. My slide, so. Let me try. Yeah. So there are, um, do you think of uh, generative AI as uh, an asset or a concern in higher education? Uh, you can use the sticky feature. Where's that? It's um on the one, two, three, four. It's the fourth icon on the left. It says sticky note. I don't have any icons on the left. Oh. Uh, is there uh is everybody else seeing an icons on the uh, on the left? Yeah. Okay, so maybe the window is not. It looks pretty open. But... Okay. Oh. Um, it could can be. I just, can I just type it in to sure. the message? Okay. Yeah, that would be fine too. Yeah, I was just kind of, I wanted to see whether we get more on one side or the other, like which uh, which column is more of a concern or which, which column. Okay. So Lynn, you have one on each side for us, one concern and one asset. True, no more excuses for typos. Yeah, a mortal threat to our current business model is probably right. We need to rethink assessments for sure. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
it does reduce the need to spend class time on certain things, very routine matters. But yes, um, all of these, I think I'm going to cover some of these uh, points in my in my part of the presentation, but not all of it. And these are all just, you know, things that will uh, crop up and will continue to crop up and will continue to change. But then we will be, um, you know, we will be confronted by new new issues. So uh, as you can see, most people have, I mean, it seems kind of evenly split. Most people have, um, I was going to say initially that there were more concerns, but now it seems like it's more evenly split. So when you look at ChatGPT's opening interface, the three things that really stand out is, one is the lack of privacy. One is they admit that it'll be inaccurate at times, and they point out that it may be biased or harmful. And so I'd like to just quickly go through these things and one, uh, one other and see if anybody has any ideas as to what can be done about all these things. So privacy, bias, inaccuracy, and ethics in an academic environment. If especially if some students are using it and others are not, you know, is it fair? So the privacy issues, the first privacy issue is this, data that is input into chat GPT cannot be deleted. Your account can be deleted, but not your data. So the data remain, remains with chat GPT. So chat GPT has access to your intellectual property, any assignments that you have, any prompts, any handouts, any tasks. And because, um, if students, for instance, you give them a case study that you got from behind a paywall and the student inputs it into chat GPT, that's a violation of the contract with the uh, provider of that case study or that article, but it is now in the public domain, so to speak, because it's out there. I'm not sure whether there are any ways of, um, taking things down from ChatGPT, but I think this is very different from Google where things are up and people can see what's up. This just enters the great discourse. So um, oftentimes people don't know what data is out there. Uh, so as I said, students may input assignments in their entirety and the supplementary material may be proprietary. Okay, so what types of assignments do you think that teachers may not want uh, disseminated? Are there things that you do that you would rather students didn't put in chat GPT? We can use the uh, we can use the chat window for this. Does anybody have anything that they want to keep to themselves or to the class for a while? So one thing that I tell my students in the in the graduate writing course is um, when we when we are about to analyze scholarly journal articles, they need to understand that they can't just copy and paste those articles into ChatGPT or Bard because it's almost like now they are uploading them um, mm -hmm. to the internet for free, and so they are violating the copyrights of those articles behind uh, paywalls. So I. I am emphasize this a lot of times just to make sure I, I told them, well, if the police knocks on your door, <laughs> then it's all, it's all on you. <laughs> and of course, I don't know if anybody can trace something like that, but maybe. Yeah. Um, I may be mistaken, but I thought that chat GPT only used information that was in the public domain. Um, it does use only information in the public domain because that's what it has access to. But once you feed it something, it becomes a part of its um, its system. So it 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 scrapes the public domain to get the initial information. So that's where the basis of all this, you know, is the great web. But as you leak information into it, 
then it becomes part of the things it knows or part of the vocabulary it has and so on. But is it is it allowed, does ChatGPT use that information to generate information back out into the public or is it somehow held back? I don't I don't think that they say that it's held back when wherever you look it seems that they don't hold it back but um there's no particular way to determine if they're using it they don't use it in the sources and so on and that's you know when well, there are no sources that's the, one of the uh, problems yes but they yes I will talk about how there are fake sources on GPT in a minute um yes so Joseph had said that yes you cannot <laughs> and Christina commented about the you know boyfriend doing all the labs this is your this is the equivalent the digital equivalent of a boyfriend doing all your work so the first thing I wanted to just briefly I mean the, after privacy the second thing I want to touch on is biases and just briefly so biases exist in language models because the because the language models it's trained on are biased so it's scraping the internet for information so all the all the biases that exist in on the internet come into chat GPT. There is an attempt to police what um, the models generate, but it isn't always successful. It's very easy to get it to work around and say, you know, uh, biased things. But, um, and people on both the left and the right find chat GPT biased. They say that it's rife with racist and discriminatory bias. And then there's uh, people who say that it's too woke and the chatbot is anti-conservative. So that it has problems on both sides because at some level it is, uh, there is some monitoring though not, you know, as I said, it's very hard for them to monitor as they should. Okay, so, um, all right. The other thing that you mentioned is the inaccuracy. Lynn, he mentioned this. Chat GPT is a language model and therefore provides coherent or commonly seen language patterns. It's like spell check, but with longer, with more words, you know? So if it thinks that this is the pattern that should conclude this thought, it concludes the thought. So chat GPT or BARD cannot lie, but they have no concept of reality either. It's just the best ending for the sentence, right? So that's what, so it just ends the sentence as appropriately as it thinks. So, so I asked chat GPT to give me a list of the most frequently cited articles in the field of artificial intelligence and education in the past uh, five years. But um, of course, chat GPT cannot access the internet past 2021. So citations will be prior to uh, 2021. I also said provide APA style citations. And chat GPT gave me this. I've only circled the first one because otherwise there would be too many red circles all over the place. Every, it, every citation is incorrect. It's chat GPT pulls together the names of legitimate researchers with um, very plausible sounding um, articles and real journals but often not the journal in which anything of that sort appeared and makes up fictitious uh, volume numbers issue numbers and dates uh, and um, page numbers so what you have is a very authentic looking um, APA style reference but it's it, none of it is accurate I, I checked up to I think the fifth one and it's not accurate. Then I asked the same thing of Bard, and I said, and this is what Bard gave me. Bard also, all of it is inaccurate, but Bard is a little closer in that, um, like 
this author published or these authors did publish in this journal, but the title of the article is incorrect. So you cannot you cannot use it for research or you have to be really wary. I'm not looking at the chats as I go along. Okay. All right. So the other uh issue is the ethics in an educational setting. Do we believe that it impacts creativity? Do we believe that it impacts critical thinking? Um, are we too willing to let's uh, to say, okay, go ahead, it's here, you can use it. So mm -hmm. how much help is too much? If chat GPT suggests an outline or a topic to a student, or directs them towards possible avenues for research or suggests types of sources? Um, is it stifling their own willingness to do the work themselves or to think about it themselves or to think about things that chat GPT may not think about because chat GPT is limited to what already exists and their brains may be able to think of things that don't already exist, so. Uh, the other thing is about creating images and graphics. I know that we've been talking essentially, I mean, primarily about writing, but I also wanted to briefly touch on images, graphics, and other um, output, video, and so on. Okay, so first, let, let me uh, talk about writing, asking AI for help writing a paper about AI. So I asked uh, ChatGPT to, to help me with an outline for a paper about artificial intelligence. Uh, okay. No, um, Lucy's question, none are accurate. It's just making stuff up. So they look good, but they, <laughs> none of them are accurate. Um, so I asked AI for help and they, it, gave me this lovely uh, outline, which was actually very good. I mean, very good in that it would be, it would be very helpful as a starting point for students. Um, and it's a very long outline, as you can see. And if you glance at it, it's, I, the suggestions are pretty sound. So is using that outline, would it be a form of plagiarism? Would I be, uh, would it be, inhibiting creativity for students to be using that. Um, so, yeah, yes, uh, the comment about um, watching three students finish their papers in the class period before it, yeah, that, that is a problem with, with chat GPT. <laughs> And the thing is, that you can tweak the level of writing, right? So you get um, you get um, students um, writing at about their level. ChatGPT's default seems to be about an undergraduate student level. And then you can ask it to do better, but um, you know, so students could use it very well. Okay, so then um, I just wanted to mention the art portion of. Um, chat GPT, uh, chat GPT or open AI, the company is also the company that has DALI. DALI is a uh, image generation software. And this image is entirely AI created and it won a digital category at Colorado State Fair last year, except the category was not for AI generated art. The category was for people who use Photoshop and other design tools, not for creating the entire work whole cloth from uh, AI. So I asked Dali to create this uh, girl with black hair carrying a kitten while looking out a window onto a spring day in anime style. And Dali created this. Of course, the cat's facing forward and sideways, if you look. So the face is not as clear as it could be. But does this showcase originality? It was my prompt. So is this, you know, so students can start submitting things even, um, you know, not in a writing class. 
that is created by AI. So um, I have a possible scenario here that uh, students could do. They could have an assignment prompt, feed it into chat GPT, which then outlines their ideas. The student could say, yes, great outline. Then uh, chat GPT could uh, create the essay and um, the student could tweak it a little bit if needed, like tell chat GPT how to adjust the vocabulary, or you could run it a little bit through Quillbot or WordTune, a couple of phrases here or there to get just the right um, idea that you want and then submit for a grade. As I think it was Joseph said earlier, we could, it can be done in half an hour, 20 minutes. Okay. So I see that people are commenting. I haven't been looking at the chats, but this is of course a point for ongoing discussion. This doesn't end here. Chat GPT doesn't end here. So, all right, I'll turn it back to Christina. Oops. So then, you know, here is the question. Uh, there is uh, there's a website. It's called Ditch That Textbox uh, Textbook, <laughs> and so they have some really good ideas about uh, using AI in education as well. And so I would like you to look at this chart, and if you could just tell us, you know, share your your feelings. <laughs> So if you look at this, you know, this gauge right here, student created versus bot created. Well, which one of these would you consider cheating? But of course, you know, the questions are also which which of these is relevant to our students' future? And which one of these would you use in your work as an as an adult? Max and I presented at um, at a conference recently in Portland, and one of the participants said that, you know, I've been using Chad GPT because I have to write my tenure application, and it's it's a lot of work, and so I'm using it as my co-editor, and I just thought, well, yeah, why not? <laughs> And I would say that it, you know, it is worth discussing these questions again within your department, within your teacher, within your teacher uh, teaching unit, or you know, not or sorry, and with your students on on day one. It would be hard to say that we all have to be on the same page because. Um, you know, we teach very different disciplines within very different disciplines. So then, you know, but, you know, have, have these discussions within departments, I think would be, would be useful. And I would say that probably the, the second question is, um, is the, mo the most thought provoking, the one that says, which of these is relevant to our students' future? Uh, I put it in the chat box that right now, um, there was a discussion on NPR and they said that there's a huge demand for prompt engineers because people who released these AI, they, they don't exactly know how to prompt <laughs> the, the tool. So they want people to, you know, to help them out. Um, and I guess if you want to be on Chat GPT four, you have to join the waitlist. But they give you priority if you're one of these people, if you're an engineer, if you can help. You know, I put myself down on the list as an educator, and I think I was like at the bottom of the list. So I don't even know when I'm going to get access to it. Um, and yeah, so I think we do have to set boundaries. Lynn, did you want to say something? OpenAI had um, the company that created ChatGPT had a hackathon last weekend, and they are going to announce plugins for everything you can imagine. 
to take this even further. And one of the ones that was very exciting to me is uh, using AI to code so non-engineers can create apps using code that work. Wow. Yeah, that, that was pretty exciting. So it gets, it's really out there. <laughs> it's thrilling. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, you know, we're, we're still just at the beginning. That's why I think, you know, let's start establishing ground rules before we get into what you just envisioned. You know, Thank you. And the... That's so important. And uh, one of the things I put in the comments is that American University can be a world leader or at least a university leader in the United States if we could get the best experts to come and help us decide what we as educators feel the limitations should be and how we can best use these technologies. I don't think any one of us here has the experience of bringing us all together with the best minds would have. And why not have American University be the center of AI and education? I know some of the deans are interested in it. Why, why wouldn't we do that? Well, challenge accepted. Excellent. <laughs> Just to quote, to, quote, to quote Sylvia Burwell. <laughs> I think um, it would be yeah. so great to be right right in the forefront of it. And I think we can bring in some people from OpenAI and other Silicon Valley companies who have been thinking about this in ways that we haven't yet. Right. And of Her course, thing. that thinking is, and this is what I, I did with my students, is I created a full page in my syllabus and I, you know, I read it together with my students. This time it wasn't like, you know, read the syllabus and let know. It's like, we're reading this page together <laughs> because I just want to make sure that they understand. But maybe the courses in the school need to be courses on teaching critical thinking so that when there aren't sources, students have the ability to use their own thought process, figure out what could be real, what isn't real, what's a fact, how do I find out? So critical thinking courses and also a course on fact checking. Right, and I believe that complex problems and um, the habits of mind courses, I think that they revolve around that um, that theme. But of course, I, I don't know what people do in their individual courses. Um, in my syllabus, I tell students that I'm going to give you digital and AI literacy skills, but you have to do what I say, and you have to do it when I say, you know, you have to follow my lead. Don't go out on your own, because then we're going to be, um, you know, not friends, <laughs> not friendly. So um, they they have this page. Uh, also, I asked Chad GPT, okay, how do I introduce AI tools in, you know, in higher ed? And then it came up with this list of seven tips. Yeah. Um, and of course, it includes what you, Lynn, just suggested about um, critical thinking. So, it, you know, it emphasized that as well. And, you know, a lot of feedback from students. This is my first semester teaching with, uh, with AI, uh, as in, uh, Chat GPT or Google Bard last semester. Um, I did introduce Wordtune and Quillbot. Um, and so um, we did have some level of discussion, but, but Quillbot and Wordtune received huge upgrades just in the past few months. And so we do talk about, okay, what these tools can do for you. And then I asked students in a video blog, okay, talk about it, share your work and show me what you changed, how you changed it, how Wordtune could help you, how a Quillbot helped you, what kind of help you got from ChatGPT. And so they recorded a five minute um, uh, you know, reflection about the tools. And, and of course, you know, all of them thought that, wow, you know, <laughs> this is so very helpful. 
Um, but they did talk about how sometimes they ask AI and it gives them a page long response and it's too much to, you know, it's too crazy. They need something simple. So then we had the discussion about prompting it well, you know, how do you prompt it? So then um, the instruction or not the instruction, but the response that you get from AI is actually helpful instead of just, you know, vomiting information at you and then you just don't know, you know, what hit you in the face. So it's good to have those conversations. Chat GPT, just like Quillbot and WordTune, has the educational um, uh, input. So if you scan the QR code, it should take you to um, the page of Chat GPT uh, when they actually ask for the input from educators. They also show educators how students should disclose the use of Chat GPT. And um, and especially if you're using ChatGPT as your co-editor, as your assistant, then, okay, claim it. You know, you're not going to pay it, but at least, you know, claim it in your paper. And so there's um, there's a way to, um, to do so. Um, and I'm handing it over to Max now. We still have a few more minutes to do a little bit brainstorming. Okay. And uh, I think, Christina, you can just keep your screen up because we're just going to look at this one, uh, I think. But with our uh, remaining uh, nine minutes or so, I'd like to invite you to consider these options here on the slide. Here's an infographic with ideas about how to uh, use ChatGPT for classroom activities. I have a couple of my suggestions uh, on the left also, uh, things that I've asked my students to do. Um, for example, when they are trying to determine a topic for their research, uh, their semester long research uh, projects, they can just chat about the topic to explore it a little bit, chat GPT. Um, they can ask whether there is extensive research. Sometimes they're asking a question that is too specific that they'll never be able to find any decent research on because it's something that is unknowable or too simple to know. Um, Chat GPT can help them uh, find out whether that is already known uh, or impossible to know, and so on. So I'll stop talking. Uh, consider these uh, suggestions here for a minute or two or three. And if you have any ideas in the chat, feel free to add them. Or if you want to just speak up, we'd be happy to hear any ideas you have uh, to make Chat GPT a beneficial part of a lesson. So I've been in the, the chat uh, speaking. I'm actually not a faculty member. So for any other program staff who are, who are thinking it's some of the, what I have to do is around marketing. So marketing events or programs, um, helping follow up with students who maybe are submitting or not submitting usually an assignment. Uh, we also connect students with nonprofits for service learning. And sometimes it's really difficult to find contact information for nonprofits or even just like a list of nonprofits in a certain area. And so using these sort of AI uh, tools to help with any of these is, is something I could find really, really helpful. And um, yeah, just like excited to, to learn more about the capacity. Again, I think within the education space, a lot of what was brought up in terms of how can we ensure that this is a tool to foster learning rather than replace it, I think is gonna be a continual challenge, but uh, for somebody who is struggling with capacity issues as as a program staff, it's it is I do find a lot of use in it. Oh, that's cool. That's kind of like using it as a librarian, but for information that is not in the library. Yeah, that's a good idea. This, this already came up a little bit earlier, uh, but an example uh, that's occurring to me that I haven't used it for, but would have been very useful last semester. Uh, I had a student who was, uh, this is an international student. He was in our advanced uh, English classes and he was uh, at the same time beginning the LLM program. That's sort of a master's degree in law uh, for usually, or maybe exclusively people with law degrees already from overseas universities. And he had some assignment, I believe, that he said it was for a 
literature review in law. Um, and I thought, oh, well, that'll be easy to, to find out what it is. Uh, but he said, no, my teacher didn't explain it. Do you know what this is supposed to be? Um, and I said, no, I don't know. I'll, I'll ask my uh, partner. She's a lawyer. Uh, so she must know what the uh, sort of standard format is for a literature review in law. And she said, no, I never had to do that in law school. So the student ended up, well, just asking his teacher, which might have been the logical first move. But if such a thing exists out there, you can ask uh, ChatGPT to explain an assignment that you don't understand or provide an example of a certain genre of writing um, just to uh, get an idea of what it's supposed to be in the event that your teacher is not providing that kind of explanation. And I think it happens to us very often. Um, we have a lot of international students and then they come to us and say, you know, my teacher asked me to do this and that. I don't know. And of course, I'm thinking I have no idea. <laughs> and it's, you know, accounting or public health. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. So, but now, um, just a few weeks ago, one of them came up to me and showed me the homework. And I said, okay, hang on, let's, let's ask Chad GPT. And sure enough, it, you know, it gave the answer, not the answer to the homework question, but to, to explain what to do. And I said, Whew, okay, I'm glad I could help. I mean, I could show you how you can help <laughs> on your own. But um, when I asked students, uh, when I surveyed my students about um, what they might use AI for, there were quite a few of them who said to clarify instructions. They, they don't understand what the teacher wants them to do exactly. So then they, they turn to AI for explanation. And I just thought, well, okay. But then I thought from the teacher end, Maybe I can then prompt it and say, give an example or a writing frame or something. So then next time I could share it with students like, OK, I said, do a literature review on some, you know, legal stuff. <laughs> this is what I mean. And so they they know exactly what it means. And I think somebody also asked um, earlier about the, the references and how ChatGPT and Google Bard just do this mash. And so I would say, yes, um, every now and then you will find a legitimate reference, but most of the time it's going to be a mesh. So it's, it's a legitimate author and journal and title, but not the same. <laughs> and so it just pulls information from, from everything. And, um, and I would say one way to check if the students are doing the work is to... Um, you know, start with the references <laughs> instead of starting with the introduction, start with the reference list. And that will tell you right away whether or not they are seeking help from outside. All right, I think that we are um, at the end of our session. Um, if you would like to have a copy of our slides, I put the link in the chat box and uh, Lindsay said that the session is being recorded. So if you need um, to see the recording or share it with uh, your colleagues, then I think Lindsay would able, will be able to um, provide the recording. <laughs>